If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the public hearing on House Bill 505 and recognize the sponsor, Representative Abramson. Good morning, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I am Representative Max Abramson, representing Hampton Falls and Seabrook. Uh, and I'm here introducing House Bill 505 which is uh, a bill that this committee has uh, undoubtedly heard uh, in the past, but for those of you who are new, um, approval voting is uh, probably the simplest change in the law, uh, in election law possible because... That's a dangerous thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> only because everything else we've considered is much, much more complicated. I looked at elections law. Um, you know, we have to look at the, at the revisions and every time someone introduces a bill, that changes the way people vote, usually there are a lot of complications. And the, the one exception to that, in my opinion, is approval voting. Uh, what, what we usually do, let's say in a municipal election, people usually bring up approval voting and instant return voting and talk about presidential elections. But I think that, that that's probably a bad example. The example that I like to use is the selections race. In Seabrook, we always have three or four people running for selectmen for one spot. And all of the other races, I serve on the town planning board and I ran unopposed. I served on the budget committee and I usually run unopposed. Um, but for selectmen, it's always a, a contentious race. And you'll have four people running for, for uh, one position. And voters will sometimes say, well, I'd like to vote for two people or I'd like to vote for three people. I hear about this a lot, and in particular in the selectmen's race. And sometimes in the school board or planning board race. But usually the selectmen's race is the one that I hear about or sometimes even our, our state house races. And what the ballot says is, if you have, let's say, uh, one seat, you're only allowed to vote for one. If you have uh, uh, my multi-member district, you're only allowed to vote for up to three. And for me, there's a, there's a personal reason for supporting approval, approval voting, and that is on lines uh, 23 and 24 of the, of the bill, which simply says, uh, the instructions to the voter, if you vote for more than the stated number of candidates, your vote for that office will not be counted. And I've done, you know, we've done uh, uh, recounts before where every once in a while somebody, they may have voted for two or they may have scratched one out, and what ends up happening is if we can't determine the intent of that voter, that person's vote doesn't count. So you've been effectively disenfranchised uh, on your vote, one of our most our most pre uh, precious and sacred rights is represented by the color white in our flag, independence. It's our right to, right to self-governance. It's our right to choose. Um, and our duty as elected officials and as public servants to present the question in front of the voters. And the voters are, are just allowed to kind of, you know, rank their, their preferences or their choices. And it's really up to them. It's their decision. And we, we just live within the... Uh, you know, the confines of uh, what the outcome of the election is. The, the biggest question that I get asked about approval voting is, what happens if you have, you know, like in Maine with their instant runoff voting, what happens if you don't have a, uh, uh, one person getting a majority, doesn't that create a complication? And it doesn't in New Hampshire law because we say, you know, plurality. Whoever the, you know, in a three-way race, the top three vote getters are the ones who win the, the three seats. Um, in, in my race, we had six candidates running for three spots. Um, why shouldn't someone, you know, some people will vote for one, two, or three. Why should they be able to vote for four or five if they like? If, if uh, voters in a selectman's race want to vote against one, an incumbent selectman and vote for the other three, why shouldn't they be allowed to do that? That's their choice. They want to indicate their preference as a voter, whatever thought process might be going on. Uh, in their mind, but, but that's their choice. It's their ballot, it's not my ballot. Um, we can make recommendations, we can ask them to do uh, different things, we can ask them to, to consider certain issues before voting on, say, a Warren article or a legislative race. But when it, when it, when it comes down to it, uh, especially in multi-member seats, and we have a lot of multi-member seats in the New Hampshire State House, um, why shouldn't people be allowed to vote for two or three or four, or all the candidates if they like? Uh, or just uh, literally vote against one person, vote for everyone except for that one individual. 
uh, it's it's really their right to vote in New Hampshire's uh, uh, particularly unusual state because we have a lot of elected positions, we have a lot of multi-member seats, we have a lot of planning board and school board races where you have three people running for two spots, and it's not the it's not the usual one-on-one -on -one race. So I, I I don't mind the presidential race being used a lot to justify switching to approval voting or a similar system. Um, but I, I think that looking at municipal elections and multi-member races are probably a better example. Uh, it doesn't cause a problem with, uh, with the vote after the fact because our elections are determined simply by a plurality in New Hampshire. So it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a simple change. And of all the different alternative voting methods that are out there, I think that approval voting is, is the best. There's no learning curve. Um, for voters who might have a hard time figuring out the, si the system or the process so they're not necessarily networked in with elected officials, um, there, you don't lose your vote if you just continue voting the way that you've been voting for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. I have people in my district who've been voting for over 60 years and they can continue voting the way they have been and it creates the smallest change. You don't have older folks um, struggling and dealing with the, with the change. There's not a big learning curve. There's not a big obstacle with approval voting. Your ballot looks almost exactly the same. Um, it doesn't require a big complicated change in uh, uh, the vote counting software. It makes, uh, it makes recounts easier instead of harder. Um, and you don't have to figure out a numbering system like instant runoff voting or some of the other alternatives. It's not to put down scoring or instant runoff voting or any of the others. Um, but we do have the um, one of the oldest populations, if not in New England, we have one of the oldest populations uh, in the country. And if older folks want to just stick to voting the way they have been, approval voting allows you to get the best of both worlds. It allows you to vote for multiple candidates or just vote for one candidate if you like. Um, and uh, it's it, it doesn't involve a. a, a great big increase in cost, and um, obviously there's no fiscal note. Uh, I'm not someone who's worked in uh, town elections before, but I, I, I can tell you that uh, I, I have asked some of the local officials in town, and they, haven't, they can't uh, conceive of any increase in cost or complexity. So uh, normally my preference is to take questions by email, but the Attorney General's office has sent down a notice to say, if they look down on that now because of how they interpret the right to work, or right to no law, sorry, how they interpret the right to no law. Um, so instead of taking questions by email, I'll just try and try and muddle through. Are there any questions for Representative? Yes. We'll start with Representative Goldman. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Abraham, for taking my question. My first question is, this new method of voting for multiple candidates for office, would it only be applicable to municipal election or it will also be applicable to state general election and presidential general elections? This one, House Bill 505, would apply to all elections. Of course, now that we've, now that I've introduced the, the bill to committee, the, the bill is property of the committee, uh, you're welcome to assign any limits that uh, the committee chooses to. If you prefer it only for legislative elections or only for municipal elections, um, I have no objection to that. I, I will say that from the general public, most of the demand for alternative voting systems comes from the presidential race. People know the most about the presidential race. They hate this candidate. They hate that candidate. They only want to vote, they'll vote for all of the candidates on this side or all the candidates on that side. Uh, so most of the demand for approval voting and some of the alternative voting systems is for the presidential race where people put the most attention on them. Uh, my preference is, is, of course, legislative and uh, municipal uh, races, but this would apply to all races. Further question, Representative Comey? Yes, follow-up question. <coughs> So one of the beauties of the election process is that one person has one vote. And whoever wins is the person that is most favored by the voters. So 
tell me, how does this go in line with that theory of one man, one vote? As a matter of fact, in multi-member seats, you have, in, in my legislative seat, to use this as an example, you have three votes. But you don't have to use all three votes. You could just, you could vote for one, you could vote for none. But that's your voter preference when you go in and you're alone in the, in, in the ballot booth. And you can mark that, how, that ballot however you want, and we just look at what the intent of your, your vote was. It doesn't dilute your vote. It doesn't maximize your vote. It doesn't change um, the impact, except to say uh, I, that in, in my town, again, as an example, people go in and they see the selectmen's race, one C, four candidates, and they frequently say that they really like two people or they like three people who are running for selectmen. They want to vote for the candidates they like. They want to vote for the candidates they know. And one of the benefits for approval voting is if you have one candidate who's just been really bad and is, is, is disliked by a large part of the town, if, if it's their preference to vote for people they like, people they know, or people they agree with, that's up to the individual voter. As one voter, you could, with approval voting, you can vote bullet vote for one person you like, or you can vote against, you know, one specific person. But it would be up to you. It's, it's, it, it doesn't change the one, you know, the one man or the one person, one vote rule. Well, one last question. Mr. One last question. Thank you. So, if we have three people that are vying for one office, and I can vote for multiple candidates. What happens if, for that one office, two people have an equal number of votes, more than one person? So we will have two people fill uh, a seat that uh, have only one position? No, it, it's, it, it, it's exactly the same as the current system. This is why I like approval voting over all of the uh, uh, um, alternatives. Let's say you have two candidates both rack up at the top 500 votes, well, that's still considered a tie just as it would be a tie if it were the, the current system and it were 400 to 400. If they were both tied at 400 or they're both tied at 500, if they're both tied, then there can be either a coin toss or there, there are other uh, uh, methods for resolving ties. Um, but the, the, the overall outcome in races is still better with approval voting than you tend to get you tend to get more of the candidates, federal, state, and local, you tend to get more of the candidates that people like and fewer of the candidates that people hate. It's less of the lesser of two evils and more of the, you know, the, the approved or good candidates are more likely to get elected. It doesn't change the, uh, uh, how we process a tie. Representative Rodon O'Brien. Thank you, sir. I'm confused. I have no idea. Um, if it went to a recount or anything like this, that the town moderator, if it was a state election, if it went to the Secretary of State, how anybody would interpret what your number one candidate is mm -hmm. and your second candidate is. The way that's interpreted now is you only vote for the candidate that you like the most. And we were talking about how there was a candidate that was performing poorly and the community mm -hmm. chose them last. That would also be reflected in the fact that they would get the fewest votes in the system we have now. So what you're asking for would not really change things in the end except create a lot of confusion because I don't understand how anybody would ascertain what your real favorite one is and then your second favorite one is. And that leaves a lot of interpretation up for election officials. And that's why a lot of people prefer scoring or instant runoff voting, or the Condorcet method. The, the, there are a whole lot of different alternatives. And some voters have very explicitly said, I had some people from the Green Party, Green Party ballot access, and they were, and they were not speaking for the Green Party. They were saying for themselves that they want to be able to number each candidate. And I remember thinking about that. If, if you're going to number each candidate that way, um, you know, you would be in the ballot booth for, for an hour you know, like the old composition test where you circle it one, two, three, and you score them or rank them. And then uh, those scored or ranked voting systems, um, um, that adds a lot of complexity. With approval voting, your ballot looks exactly the same as it does now, except that we've just, you know, we've kind of scratched, 
changed a little bit of the wording, but we scratched out the provision that says, if you vote for more than the stated number of candidates, your vote for that office will not be counted. We're just deleting that line. So if you still choose to vote for one, you're voting for one. If you're voting for two of them, you're just filling in the, the, the blank for two candidates. If you want to vote for all three, that's fine. You could fill in the, fill in the, uh, the oval for all three. It's, it's your choice, it's your right as a, this is just recognizing your right as a voter to indicate your voting preference as, as, as you see fit without putting an artificial limit on it. Further question? Yeah. Yeah. Representative O'Brien, did you have a further uh, question? Well, yes, but Representative Gay does, so that's fine. Representative Rooney. I didn't have a question. Um, I saw a hand over there. Representative Gay. <laughs> Would you say that this is a, like a very simplified form of rank choice, only you didn't have to rank, and, and this way the person who is a, approved by the most people uh, even though they'd have to vote for several people, that would show in their in their numbers. You couldn't add them up and say this many votes were uh, were allowed mm -hmm. because all of them would be allowed. Mm -hmm. But this but this way it would be it, equivalent to rank choice, but way easier mm -hmm. to tally. Um, and that way, the most people would get a person that they like, a multiple candidates that they thought was good. Right. Um, it's it's the easiest system. It's actually, it, it's the only alternative voting system that's actually easier than our current system because right now you have to look at the details and say you can only vote for one. And this one you can vote for up to three. Um, this, this removes all that. You can vote for as many candidates as you want. Um, I have a lot of older constituents in Seabrook who um, it's a, it's a little bit difficult sharing instant runoff voting with them, and it would be, it would be harder to, to change that, not to put down the alternative systems, but approval voting is the simplest. Approval voting allows people who uh, might be averse to change, it allows them to still have their, their interests represented, um, and it would allow for example, minor parties like the Prohibition Party uh, is, is still out there. If they want to get on as a one-issue voter, a one-issue party, and have the Prohibition Party and then, and then collect votes, you could vote for the Prohibition Party candidate, but then also vote for your preferred candidate. And who knows in my favor? A few votes. But it, it doesn't involve a big learning curve. It's very simple, and we can continue using the existing ballots that we're, that we're putting out. We don't have to send everyone to a class. Representative Sandler. I'm okay. sorry, that was the hand I saw. <laughs> <laughs> you straighten out my, my name thing there. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, on your uh, markup of the bill here, uh, in paragraph one, uh, the, it instructs the uh, printing on the ballot of the words, vote for not more than blank. Here insert the total number of candidates. Suppose this is a selectman race, mm -hmm. and there are two offices available, okay. but there are four people on the ballot, and I'm not doing any kind of a ranking of them saying, this is my favorite, this one I really don't like very much, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I turn in four votes, but there are only two offices. How do you distinguish which one I'm really voting for? You're, it, 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 uh, that's actually a good question. It, you vote for all four candidates, and there I do have I do have some constituents who said that they would vote for all four. They would vote for all four selectmen candidates, whether it's uh, one or two uh, uh, seats. If you vote for all four, then all four of them get a vote. So one of them might be way ahead, but when your ballot gets counted, everyone's numbers go up by one vote. Um, it's still the same. It's still the same system. Everyone ends up with a higher number of votes. However, um, you, you still have you, you probably still have the same winner. You're, if you're voting for all four candidates, you're not actually affecting the outcome of the race. Um, so most people would vote for one, two, or three in that case. So in other words, but that's a good example. Right now we're saying 
vote for the not more than the total number of seats, approval voting just changes that to vote for not more than the total number of candidates running. Okay, but a further question, Representative. Yeah, follow up, please. Thank you. Yep. Uh, if you're voting for, for the total number of candidates, mm -hmm. how are you selecting the, the person who will fill the limited, lesser number of seats? Uh, when the vote, vote tallies are finally tallied, if there were two selectmen seats, if, if one candidate won 400 votes, another one won 300, another one won 200, another one only won 100 votes, you still have the top two vote getters in other words, the plurality, the top two vote getters still get the race. So that does still win the election. What if that there are three to get 400? What's that? What if there are three to get 400? If that's a three-way tie, you could theoretically have a three-way tie uh, under the current system. This doesn't change the number of ties that would occur, but, but there, there's legislation, there are customs and past practice for, for dealing with, with tie outcomes. That wouldn't change. The only thing that would change is Instead of limiting people to the total number of seats, you're limiting people to the total number of candidates. Thank you. Representative Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question, Representative. So, uh, it's a two-part question. I guess the first part is that I think your goal here is to get rid of um, overvotes. Is that the goal here? Is that you have people where vote for two and they actually do three and therefore their vote's completely invalidated and it has no ch no uh, no value at all? Right. Right. That's... that. For me, that's my, my personal reason for, for preferring this method over all the others, including over the current system. Because when we did, when we did look at ballots, if, if people had marked two different candidates for a particular local office, their vote didn't count at all. So they had, they had come into the rec center, they had voted, or, or your local school, or town hall, or if you're voting for church, your local voting place, they had voted, and now their vote doesn't count. They've, lost, they've literally lost their right to vote. I would rather have them you're voting for two candidates for two spots, I would still rather than have both of those votes count, even if it doesn't influence the outcome of the election, even if it's the same outcome, but at least they've been able to register their their preference. Okay. Second question, Mr. Uh, for further question, Representative Lang. So, if, if the goal is to get away from um, overvotes, mm -hmm. in the in the scenario uh, by Representative uh, Sandler over there said, if I vote for all candidates, isn't that the equivalent of not voting for any candidates? It has no impact on the race whatsoever. So again, I just invalidate my vote altogether. No, because um, um, everybody, all the votes would rise by one, all the votes would drop by one. So it has no impact on the race whatsoever, and it invalidates my vote if I don't understand how this voting process works versus picking one person. Um, a little bit of backstory: um, in my home state of Washington, a lot of people tend to view it that way. They want to influence the outcome of the election. When I came to New Hampshire, a lot of New Hampshire natives uh, were saying, the language was a little bit different. It was, they were saying, I should have the right to vote for whatever I want. And they, it, it was almost like they were saying, well, who cares what the outcome of the election is? That's for everybody else. Well, they just kind of take a hakuna matata approach. And then if, it, if there's even one voter in town who has that kind of I guess old school New Hampshire approach where I'm just going to register my preferences and then it, it turns out how it turns out. And I hear that at, at town hall meetings all the time and I hear that at budget committee meetings all the time and I, I it, maybe it's kind of a unique New England thing, I'm not sure, but people just kind of go in and they register what their opinion is, almost like it's a short letter to the editor or something. They're just registering their opinion by voting for candidates. So. For some people, they're happy to just go in and, and vote for both candidates in a race and say, "Hey, I like both of you." You might have a you might have somebody who's a lifelong Democrat, but they vote for you, also. So they're, you're voting they're voting for both candidates because you came to their door. And you know who knows what thought process there is going on inside the voter, but the difference is it's their ballot, and our responsibility as elected officials is not to say. We're trying to influence the outcome of the race. What we're trying to do is just place the ballot in front of them and allow the voters to say whatever they want through their ballot, through their voting preferences. So if somebody wants to cap, if somebody wants to vote for you and your opponent, well, that's fine. That's their choice, and it's not going to no, it's not going to influence the outcome of the race. 
but why should we say you have to vote for one or none? If, he, if, if the voter wants to say, I'm going to vote for both of these guys, that's their choice. It's not mine. It's their ballot. Thank you. Representative Moynihan. Thank you. Uh, have you looked into whether or not uh, voting machines in New Hampshire would be able to count these votes in the way your bill suggests without all being modified? And if they have to be modified, how much it would cost municipalities to modify their voting machines? Uh, I, I did ask at the town clerk's office, and I have asked some of the people involved in local elections, and they've said that it, they didn't think that it would, it would cost anything. It would just be an update. Representative Moynihan. So you don't, there, this is sort of anecdotal questions. It doesn't sound like you've gotten any firm, uh, official, uh, expert answer on whether or not these machines are all going to have to be recalibrated to do it in the way your bill proposes. Am I hearing you correctly? Not, not from the state. I've only talked to folks who work in the elections process in town. They didn't think that it would be a big, happy, I guess, high mandatory cost. The, they run on software. I, I, sh I should have said this as a dis disclaimer when I started. I do write embedded software. Embedded software has to be updated all the time. Um, I, I assume that the software in the voting machines is being updated regularly. Just I think that this could be done with the regular updates. Thank you. Security. Representative Prudhomme O'Brien. Thank you, sir. So if I was in uh, voting for selectmen and there were three spots and I only wanted to vote for one, that was there's only one candidate I thought could be the job. Well, um, so I voted for one, but my neighbor voted for two. Wouldn't that mean that my neighbor had two votes and I have one vote in the same election? No. And there's only here. one seat available? You have, you have one ballot. Um, but uh, I would disagree with that. And, and the reason is, um, with approval voting, everyone is getting kind of the same deal. Everyone is getting kind of the same impact. If, so if you're voting to influence the outcome, some people are voting to influence the outcome because they want their guy to win. Some people are voting just to, to state their preference. Usually the neighbor who's voting for two is just saying, in Seabrook, I can't speak to your town. But usually they're saying, oh, I know this person and I go to church with them. Oh, I know this person from the grocery store. And a lot of people will vote for two. They have the right to. Uh, they have the right to do that. Um, currently, a few people do that already, and their votes get kicked back, or their vote currently doesn't get counted. Um, so I don't. But I don't see that as a, a loss to me if I'm voting as one voter if my neighbor votes for two people. Um, and. The way I view it is it, 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 it's your ballot and you have the right to kind of mark it the way you, you choose to. Any further questions for Representative Abramson? Seeing none? Yes. Sorry, Are you fired? Yes. Okay. Oh, Representative Gay. I, I'm wrestling with the, mm -hmm. the map, the arithmetic of this. Mm -hmm. And so would you say it's correct? It's, it's, it's kind of like the evaluation matter, man, uh, matters depending on how many, what kind of race you're talking about. So um, would you say that if you have uh, four candidates running for two places, chances are most people are not going to vote for all four and not influence it at all. Chances are some people will vote for two. Well, a few people do. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, and we know that doesn't influence the outcome. That just says I'm, I'm okay with all of these. But the chances are, in the case that she just set up, where one person votes for two, and I didn't know, she didn't specify the race, whether it had two or three people in it, but one person votes for two and one person votes for one, does that put the person with the one at a disadvantage? I don't think so, because the two is this right, is what I'm trying to say, because the person who voted for two in a two-person race really is an influencing outcome. The person who's voting for one is putting that person ahead. If it was a three-person race, both of them would be influencing, you know, the two and the one. And it's true. The second person and the first person voted for could outvote the one. 
that the next door neighbors voted for it. But it's it, it still it still sounds equal. It still sounds fair because people are voting for who they want mm -hmm. and they're going to be happy. And maybe a whole lot of people are going to be happy with, with you know, the multiple ones that voted for it and not with that single vote. Anyway, it just, the chips fall still, I think, in the same place. Well, I think starting with the raw material that we've got in my town, for the, for the down ticket local races, I don't think that people are going to be happy no matter what because we have, usually what happens in my town is we'll have two people running for two planning board spots and we'll sometimes have one person running for two budget committee spots. We have unfilled positions every year so in, this, in that case the issue is moot. In the presidential races, I know that people aren't going to be happy about the outcome. But when you chart all the different voting systems, approval voting gets you not happy excited people who are ready to go celebrate or whatever they do in Boston and they riot and overturn cars and everything so happy with the results. <laughs> they um, you know watch out for what happens at the Super Bowl, you know, next Sunday. But um, it's not that people are so enthusiastic they're ready to take to the streets, but you have the highest I wish I had the chart with me. You've probably gotten it a couple of times on the hand up. It's approval voting's not just the simplest, but it also gets you the, the most Voter satisfaction. Um, it, well, I should say, it's tied with instant runoff voting for voter satisfaction for people being happy with the end result. But it's much simpler than instant runoff voting. Um, and um, the reason is, it allows you to do tactical voting if you want. But but we as elected officials are always thinking about well, what's the outcome in this. How's this going to affect the outcome of local races? How's this going to affect the outcome of state house races? But it, it, the vast majority of voters I talk to usually say, I just want to be able to vote how I vote. I don't want all the voting restrictions. And Thank this just lifts. Oh, oh. Right. Oh, one last question. One last question. Yes. Has there been any study of this kind of voting, either somewhere, do you have any data, facts and figures that you can show us? Because I'm confused. Uh, yes, um, there's, a, there's a website called uh, Approval Voting, and they, they look at all the different uh, voting methods, and they have conducted studies on outcomes, and they have actual real-world examples on their website. Um, if, uh, if the chairman is all right with it, I'll, I'll, I'll come back uh, tomorrow with a handout on, on what the results of those studies and what the, uh, um, what the outcomes have been on. Why didn't you bring them to this? Mm -hmm. um, because it's been, the, we've turned the same handout in on this approval voting bill um, every year and it ends up being the same handout and I assume for some reason that there would be a lot more senior members of the committee who, who, who've been here before. So I, I should have just come in and, and brought the same hand out again. And, and given it. Okay. Thank you. Representative Lane, I would remind the members of the committee we are behind. Um, you recognize Representative Lane. Thank you. In that data, would you include where this is in place? Any further questions, Dr. Abrams? Seeing none, thank you very much. Chair recognizes Mr. Alvin C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Alvin C. I live in Loudoun and I'm representing myself and I'm in favor of this. Uh, <coughs> one thing that I would like to uh, mention it's not unusual for voters to be okay with one or two of the candidates that are running for an office, but not a whole bunch of them. And whether it's because of partisan values or, or a non-partisan race, whether they like them or not, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So this allows the voters to vote for those that they feel acceptable to, to fill that office. Uh, 
in the end result, though, is that the person with the highest number of votes wins. Uh, it, it doesn't do it any other way than what we're doing right now. The uh, case where it was suggested where one person votes for one candidate and another person votes for two candidates, the, uh, the person voting for two candidates can only vote one vote for each candidate, not two votes for one candidate, so it doesn't double their uh, ability to vote for a particular candidate. So the end result is you can have um, candidates uh, vote totals that where more than one candidate can have more than 50% of the vote. Uh, you can also have it where nobody gets 50%. Our uh, vote counting system that we use now is known as plurality, and uh, in fact our constitution requires plurality for governor, the executive council, and the senate. The other races, they, they're silent on what type of voting system to use. Because this approval voting allows for uh, the highest vote getter to win, that meets the definition of plurality, which is just whoever gets the most votes, not necessarily a majority. In the case of uh, the ballot counting machines, for every election, they have to be programmed for that particular election, for that particular precinct. And in that regard, the only thing you would be doing differently would be uh, not programming in an, uh, a number which would constitute an overvote. You would allow somebody to vote for uh, more than one candidate if it's one candidate office. So, and I think that meets the constitutional requirement for those particular uh, seats that are um, specified as plurality. The one man, one vote. Um, phrase came from a Supreme Court decision against a state that had very uh, unbalanced uh, sizes for U.S. Congress districts, and that was uh, to require them to equalize the size of their congressional districts. It had nothing to do with uh, whether or not uh, approval voting should be allowed, because in this case you're getting one ballot and you're able to express a little bit more information than what you can now. The uh, current system is essentially exactly equivalent to what we have now as compared to approval voting where every voter votes for only the one candidate, um, which is referred to as bullet voting. And some people even in multi uh, seat races bullet vote because they want to get their person in, which is fine. That's, that's the way people are. Uh, oh, and one, one other quick thing, uh, for nonpartisan municipal elections, uh, primary elections could actually be eliminated because the approval voting can accommodate a large ballot. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Any questions for Mr. C from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. I recognize Ian Friedman, representing the New Hampshire Liberty Party. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so as somebody who is a co-chairman of a very small third party here in New Hampshire, I have to say that approval voting is good because choices are good. The more choices we have, whether they be from political candidates or in the marketplace, we like that as uh, consumers and uh, as voters here, being able to make the decision, let's say it's a three-person race, like the race for governor uh, was this, this past election. Oh, I like candidate A, but I also like candidate B. No much care for C. I'll go ahead and vote for both A and B because I'd be okay with either one of those people getting into office. Uh, the current system forces me to choose only one so this is a much better system because it, it's simple. It's, you don't, I don't have to sit there and think, oh, I wanna, is this my number one choice? Is this my number two choice? It's, it's 
easy to just say, yep, yep, no. And that's all we're talking about here. It's not a big change, it keeps it simple, and uh, it eliminates any kind of confusion which would come in from some of the more complex uh, alternative voting systems. So I say choices are good. Happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening. Any questions for Mr. Freeman? From the Seeing none, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on House Bill 505? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and we'll go. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.